Okay, it's and we're live. All right, thanks, uh, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Laura Waller from Berkeley. I'm super excited to have her because I've asked her a number of times uh, for summer schools, and the answer has always been that Berkeley starts early uh, in the summer and she's never been available. So, this is one of the great quirks of uh, COVID-19 that we're able to have Laura. Laura has been doing amazing work on computational imaging over the previous years. And rather than take up this time uh, with going through any of that, I'm going to hand over uh, and get stuck in uh, to questions. So I need to open my uh, questions Q&A tab. And uh, I'm not actually seeing the questions now, Aaron. So we, we don't have any in yet. Um, so if you okay. want, maybe want to give a quick uh, overview of what you study, Laura, or what your area of research is, uh, while we wait for some questions sure. to come in. Um, so overview. So I did some lectures on intro to imaging, and then some, and then one on computational microscopy, which is my research. Uh, which one do you want to go over? Um, Start uh, what are you think, Brian? Computational, I guess. Yeah. Let me just go to the slides. Okay. So I can see the questions are starting to come in now, so that's good. Yeah, so my computational imaging uh, slides are here. You should be able to see them now, the slides order. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to pause the big upload that I'm doing so I don't, my computer doesn't crash. Yeah, I can see a green L right now, uh, but I guess. You can, can you see the slide? It looks red. Here we go. Yeah. All right. Very good. It says bad network quality. Yeah, just a moment and I'll get them live onto the student screen as well. It just takes a, another minute then to come through here. I can see part four computational imaging. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I can just go over the, maybe the basics of computational imaging. That's the first few slides here. Uh, so the, the main idea is that you do joint design of hardware and software. So you have some imaging system. Uh, you're trying to image something X. Maybe it's the phase of your sample. Maybe it's the 3D structure. Maybe it's the fluorescence information. Um, and it passes through some optical system that you design. Uh, you take a measurement A, or you take it, it passes through some system A, sorry, and you take measurements Y. So the measurements are almost always um, intensity measurements. So maybe X is a complex field, and you can map how that complex field propagates through your system. Um, but the measurements are usually this 2D sen intensity sensor. So if you think about this as the image system design piece, then uh, the second part of it is the computation. So now you've taken these measurements, y, and they're somehow related to the, the input object x. Now you need to solve an inverse problem to solve for x, basically. And so sometimes this is really simple. If the A matrix is a traditional imaging system, then it'll be just the identity matrix. So you're directly trying to map x in your, your sample onto your uh, sensor, y. And then you don't need to do an inverse problem. You just measured it directly. But in computational imaging, we frequently um, take very indirect measurements where that Y doesn't look anything like the sample X, um, particularly if you're trying to do something higher dimensional like 3D or phase imaging where it's invisible. Your measurements are definitely going to be indirect and not look exactly like your final result. So you have to solve this inverse problem with an algorithm. Uh, and we sort of have these two toolboxes of hardware and software. Uh, so we can put, we can design the optics and the physical system uh, as we like, and we can design the computation given whatever 
uh, optimization or computational algorithms we have in our hands. And really like the heart of computational imaging is this feedback between the two where you get, uh, you design the imaging system knowing what's possible in computation. And then you design the computational inverse problem knowing what your system actually looked like. And so let me give one concrete example. Um, this is the Fuser Cam. It's a really fun project we've had in my lab. And it's this canonical uh, problem of lensless imaging. So you have a camera and you just take off the lens and you, uh, so you just have a sensor pointed at the world and you take a picture, it looks like total garbage, right? Um, so if you think about it, the lens's only job was to bend the light rays coming into the camera such that uh, a point in the scene forms an imaged point on the sensor. And so by removing the lens, uh, we're not forming an image anymore. That's why this image looks like garbage. But uh, this, the light that hit the sensor is the same light that would have hit the sensor if the lens was on that camera. Uh, it's just it hasn't been bent in the correct way. So if we can computationally bend the light, we could potentially theoretically take this single measured image and reconstruct our scene. Now, this doesn't work in practice. It's not, uh, it's not possible sort of in the real world. Um, so diffuser cam was this idea that we can bend the light rays in any random way uh, and still maybe solve this problem. So we put a diffuser in front of the sensor. This is like, sometimes it's literally just the stickers that you put on your windows so your neighbors cannot see in. And so you take this privacy glass sticker and you stick it, you just stick it on top of the cover less that's sitting on the sensor. So it's uh, a few millimeters away from the actual sensor. And when the light hits this diffuser or scattering element, it scatters. So it bends in random way, scatters. And then you take a picture that also looks like garbage because all you did was take this unfocused light and scattered it more. Um, but now you bent it uh, or manipulated it, bent it in, uh, in a more deterministic way. And from this image, we can actually uh, do some computation, solve an inverse problem and reconstruct the scene. Um, so, uh, this has a lot of caveats, but this is a great example of computational imaging because it you, you need a hardware, you need to change the hardware and you need to add this computational software. And of course, we didn't just try sticking something on the camera and then try to figure out the computational inverse algorithm. And we didn't just figure out an inverse algorithm and then try to design the perfect camera to match it. We did some sort of back and forth between the two deciding uh, what's the most convenient way to do everything and uh, and we end up with this camera that is very thin and lightweight and very inexpensive. Um, it's kind of a fun toy that that you can play with. Uh, but later on in the talk, I talked about how we can extend it to three dimensions uh, or other higher dimensional spaces. So maybe that's a good intro, and we can stop to take questions now, and, or I can talk more that's great. more about the summary. Yeah. No, that, that's wonderful. So so does that that also have some advantages in terms of uh, the amount of light that you can collect, the light efficiency when, you, when you're down to the number, you know, uh, trying to economize with every photon that you can get? And, and also, does it allow you to use broader band sources uh, when, when you don't have to use uh, very specific anti-reflection coatings? Um, so, okay, so that's a lot of pieces. <laughs> um, let me talk about it then sort of one at a time. Um, okay, so uh, if you think about this system, um, so in my lectures in particular, I talked about point spread functions. Um, can you see my screen still? Yes. Okay, um, so I talked about point spread functions. So a regular, um, a regular camera, you try to make the point spread function as small of a point as possible. So a point in the world maps to a point in the scene. This diffuser cam, it's, or you can design weird point spread functions. This diffuser cam has a point spread function that looks like a caustic pattern. And so we're not actually losing any photons. Um, all the light that, the, if we had, if we had a lens that are the same size as the sensor, we get the same light hitting the sensor. It's just not focused into points. And so, um, you don't lose any photons, but spreading them out is bad. 
So um, you're spreading them out. So instead of focusing this point in the scene onto a, a point on the sensor, we're focusing a point in the scene onto this caustic E pattern. And uh, that's bad for SNR because you're spreading out the photons. And so then um, you're going to hit get hit harder by Poisson noise. So you don't want to spread them out too much, but the spreading them out is critical for doing uh, compressed sensing. So when I talked about going to three-dimensional or hyperspectral or um, time super resolution with this system, that wouldn't be possible without this spreading. There's also the fact that uh, making this camera compact requires you to spread the photons. So if you, uh, if you have a lens, it has to be placed a certain distance away to give it enough space to, to focus the light. Um, so if you want to make this sort of lensless situation where you're just putting a mask very close to the sensor, it has to be uh, it has to have a distributed point spread function. And so you have to be in this regime where you're spreading the light. So basically, like uh, the spreading the light helps in some ways. It hurts in, in a lot of ways, but we we're going to do it. And so we want to do it in a careful way. And we certainly consider different applications. Here's the scotch tape version, but maybe I can I can't see my screen slides order. Um, so maybe I can show you some of the implications of of how much it hurts you SNR wise. Um, OK. I think I'm opening up the wrong slides here. Uh, so uh, here's a no. Sorry, I have. I think I opened up the wrong slides here, but um, I don't have it easy to find. Um, so this can maybe show something. So this is like comparing different masks. So in the end, actually, what we use is not this off-the-shelf diffuser but uh, a carefully optimized phase mask that looks like this. It actually looks like a bunch of lenslets that are sort of randomly positioned in space. And um, these are the reconstructions that we get for a, a ground truth object like this. So we were trying to get at something with the best possible resolution. Um, and so we use this because it has a point spread function that looks um, a lot more like a random array of spots. Uh, yeah, I think, okay, here we go. Here's one of the point spread functions. So um, you can see here now that we have this random array of, of lenslets. Then we have like different things coming into focus at different times. And so that is beneficial because um, you have sharp points, so that sets your resolution. The, the spatial frequencies in your point spread function sets your resolution, just like in a regular situation uh, with a, a single lobed point spread function. Um, so you want these sharp points because they give you the resolution, but you want the spreading out of the light because it gives you the multiplexing, and you want lots of black space in between um, in order to avoid this problem of uh, creating a background that gets hit by Poisson noise worse. And so then we also wanted to do 3D imaging in this case. And so we've designed this point spread function so that different lenslets come into focus. Uh, Laura, in I'm point. still seeing your slide sorter, I think. Is that what you intended or not? No, it should be showing. That's interesting. It's not just showing my screen. So I have a slide open. I see your mouse moving and I see a slight sorter. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, let's see. You can just reshare, I guess. Be behaving like a uh, an extended screen or something. No. Oh, there you go. Great. OK. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why I did that. My computer is saying it has poor internet quality, so maybe it's just slow. <laughs> okay, right. so here's the point spread function. Um, as I change depths. Oh yeah, it's extremely slow. Uh, 
maybe if I stop sharing and share again. Okay, anyways, I can do it without putting it in presentation mode. Maybe it'll save some power. Yeah. Um, so this is the idea of a point spread function that has sharp points and lots of black in between, but it's also distributed and spread out because this is good for SNR. So while you're doing that, I just want to let people know that we we've sort of merged these sessions together. So we will still take the half hour break uh, at 7 p.m. UK Irish time. Uh, but feel free to ask uh, questions for this or the next uh, session. So the first half of Laura's um, lectures um, as we go through. And yeah, so we, we have a good number of questions in Laura, so I can start asking whenever you're ready. Yeah, that sounds good. Go ahead. All right, so Atta Kazari wants to know in the examples of lecture two, um, minute 624, the, uh, the NA of all the objectives are greater than one. In our imaging system, we set the F number to F8 and therefore our NA would be 1 16th or 0 0.06. Are we measuring our NA correctly? Uh, I don't have the video timings. I'm not sure if you know what the slide number. Um, let's see. While Aaron is searching for that, maybe a short question from Julian. Uh, in phase contrast microscopy, why is pi phase shift used? Oh, great question. OK, so I can go to the contrast mechanisms lecture and maybe I'll just do a quick uh, overview for people who forgot. Um, so in phase contrast, um, Oops. I don't uh, see your screen. So phase contrast microscopy is where you put this. Um, I don't see your screen, Laura. You put this okay. uh, element okay. into your microscope, Coming, so a phase yes. shifting element, and it causes the DC term to um, shift relative to the rest of the spatial frequencies. Uh, sometimes it's done with an annulus, but it's pr the same sort of principle that you want to uh, take all of the light except for the DC term and interfere with the DC term, which is just the on axis traveling light. Uh, and you shift it by pi so that things that have uh, very little phase variation will show up really brightly. So if you look at this leaf here, then you see some like sort of this, these ridges pop out very clearly in the phase contrast image. And that's because um, you're getting constructive interference. Whatever their phase shift is, is constructively interfering uh, with this 
background or the um, the light from the DC term. And uh, wherever they don't have those ridges, you're getting uh, destructive interference, so it's darker. So the whole point is just to create contrast. We can actually look at um, We can look at the equations if you want to get into the technical pieces of it. Um, but so here's a, a sort of a model system for phase contrast, Zernike phase contrast. So you take your plane wave illumination, phase object has some uh, exponential with the phase here. And then you, the first, the, the objective lens of the microscope is effectively a 2F system. Um, so you have the Fourier transform here, and then you have this pi by two phase shift for the, the DC term only, and you have to choose how big this is, sort of balancing how much light is getting through versus uh, which spatial frequencies you care about. And then you take intensity uh, after one other Fourier transform by the tube lens, and you get this phase contrast. And so if you write the equations for that, then sort of the key approximation for Zernike phase contrast is to treat this, this is the samples exponential. So it has no absorption, so there's just a one out front. And then um, and then you have this phase distribution uh, as an exponential. And you can, for small angles, you can approximate that as one plus i phi, where phi is the phase. So for small phase deviations, this one plus i phi is a good linear approximation. And that makes the math more uh, easy to digest. So then uh, we take intensity of that, then we're basically taking the intensity of this one plus i phi, which is going to be approximately one for these small phase changes. But then all of the uh, all of the higher order, uh, like phi squared terms, we can ignore now because we're talking about small phase. And so then if we, we figure out the output um, field, which is g out, and then the output intensity, we essentially get like one plus two phi. So we want to choose um, we want to choose the the DC term shift so that we maximize contrast, and that's uh, so this this pi uh, pi by two phase shift here on the on the DC term is going to maximize contrast once you include this two in here. It does the shift by pi in the end. Does that makes sense, hopefully. Okay, that that's really great. Um, to go, uh, Mark, uh, yes, to come back to the first question. Uh, you asked, it's slide 12 in the wave optics and PSF lectures. It's the one where you talk about which objective do you want? So Arne, you could Did share. Go to the next Andy. question. Yeah, I can, I can share that. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, Aaron is bringing it up, so there you go. Yes, this this one here. So I think that's the slide they were referring to in the question in the examples yep. of lecture two. The numerical aperture of all objects are greater than one. In our imaging system, we set the F number to F8 and therefore our numerical aperture would be one over 16 equals 0 0.06. Are we measuring our numerical aperture correctly? So I think that uh, Aaron is showing the slide lecture two to go with the first question which was the NA of all objectives is greater than one. That's correct. So uh, the reason the NA of all these objectives is greater than one is because they all say oil on them. So you see beside the NA 1.25, 1.25, 1.4, it all says oil. Um, you can really only get above one uh, if you use immersion objectives, either in water or oil, because oil has a refractive index of 1.3 or one, oil is about 1.5, water is about 1.3. And uh, your NA is uh, N sine theta. So obviously sine theta can't get above one. So you need an N. So you need your N to be greater than one. And the, NA, the N 
which is refractive index of air is one. So to get that uh, refractive index above one is the only way to make your Na go above one. And so um, if you use oil, your refractive index is 1.5. Basically, you get 50% more Na uh, kind of for free. OK, so the question was, in our imaging system, we set the F number to F8. So if you recall, the F number is just uh, 1 over 2 times the Na. So F8 means you should have uh, 1 over 16 as your Na. So uh, this question calculated that to be 0 0.06. Um, are we measuring Na correctly? So that yes, that's correct. So if you have an F8 lens, uh, maybe on your, this is probably on your SLR camera, then you're going to have NA of 0.06. So that's a very small NA, right? A microscope almost always has a higher NA than 0 0.06. But it also makes sense because you have to think about NA as being the range of angles in the system. So in a microscope, your sample is very close, uh, very close to the objective. And so you have a better chance to get this large range of, of angles. So in a microscope, you'd have a very tiny objective if you're only, you know, millimeters away and getting only 0.06 as your uh, NA. Uh, in photography, uh, this is a more normal NA because your object is usually really far away. And so even though the actual physical lens in photography is much bigger, the object is so far away that the angle it subtends is still really small. And so uh, this is sort of like a, a typical photography NA, and this is part of probably why microscopy uses NA, whereas photography uses F numbers. Okay, very good. Um, Mohamed Besser wants to know um, how the experimental results would change if the illuminations by the LED lights uh, found on the coded illumination microscope changed the pattern quicker or slower. Should I go to another question? Oh, I don't know if you're hearing me. Um, I, I, um, um, so uh, there's an easy one next. Uh, I think Laura must have muted her her speaker. She's not here. Oh, uh, sorry. Us. Sorry, I just I was wondering what was going on there. I can hear you now. Oh, excellent. Great. Okay, great. Uh, so I was getting feedback. Um, oh, <laughs> I see. So um, I, I just asked you another question from Mohammed Besser. So I, I'll ask again. I was wondering how the experimental results would change if the illuminations by LED lights found on the coded illumination microscope changed pattern quicker or slower. Uh, sure. So. Uh, Maybe I'll just answer this without slides. But our LEDs are very fast. They're about a thousand times faster than the uh, the fastest frame rate of our camera sensor. And so going faster doesn't really help. We're actually running them much slower than they need to go than they are, could go. Um, if they're slow, then you need to make your frame rate of your camera slower, which means your exposures take a lot longer. Um, and then your capture obviously takes longer. Uh, so uh, how bright they are is really important as well. So the, the brightness is usually more important because the switching speeds of LEDs are always going to be much faster than camera frame rates. Um, one thing that's really cool that we've tried to do is to try to exploit the fact that the LEDs are so much faster than the frame rates of the sensor to display patterns, display multiple patterns for each exposure. Um, so why would you want to do that? Basically, what you're going to get is just the integrated sum of, of the results from all those patterns. Um, but if your sample is moving, then you get this coded motion blur. And you can you can computationally undo motion blur when it's coded. This is called flutter shutter. There's a really nice paper by Ramesh Raskar at MIT a long time ago where he took a, a photography camera and he put an electronic aperture on it that could code the code the exposure, code the aperture um, in time while taking a single exposure. So we did the exact same thing for a microscope. We flashed the LEDs um, with like specifically designed patterns 
over time during a single exposure and then did a computational inverse problem. It was just a deconvolution to uh, recover the um, motion de-blurred image. So we want to do that actually, like for photography, for Fourier photography, we would love to be um, patterning the illumination LEDs and doing this motion deep blurring. And we started to try that, but it was one, it's a huge mess computationally. It's a very big computational problem when you add this extra dimension of time. Um, but also live cell samples tend to move relatively slowly. And we actually realized that they're just not moving fast enough for it to be useful. So we kind of gave up on the idea because it seems like such a huge technical challenge to do the computation. Um, but and for like very minimal benefit because the samples were actually quite slow that we were looking at. OK, so I'm going to ask the, the next two questions in reverse order. If, if it's something that our eyes. Oh, sorry. Can you explain what phase imaging is? And if it's something that our eyes can't see, how are we modifying the information in phase contrast imaging in a way that we can then visualize as an image? And sorry, I'm new to this. <laughs> in parentheses. Sure, so um, I don't know what this person's background is, but if you've done engineering, you talk about uh, signals or signals and systems or electromagnetics, you talk about light as a wave, right? So light as a wave, it's going up and down like a sinusoid. It has an amplitude and a phase. The phase describes how, uh, how delayed or advanced that wave, wave front is relative to maybe other parts of the wavefront. Um, and so uh, phase imaging is all about uh, measuring those phase delays. So maybe I can find a, a more intro slide here. Uh, yeah, so um, look at this one. So uh, this is, for example, a HeLa cells, cancer cells, and if you just look at them in a regular microscope, you don't see them at all. They're completely invisible because they don't change the absorb the intensity of the light. So you shine light on them, and the reason you would see contrast to see a cell is because it's going to absorb some of the light somewhere and not absorb it elsewhere, and so then you would see dark spots wherever it absorbed the light. So a lot of cells don't absorb light, and this was a big problem a long time ago. Um, Zernike won a Nobel Prize for phase contrast imaging because he made these kinds of things visible. Um, so one way to get around it is to use fluorescent tags. So you inject something or like purposely modify the cells so that it, it glows in a particular color. Um, this is not that at all. This is a, a just intrinsic contrast that we're not going to modify the cell at all, but we want to see it. So phase, phase imaging allows you to do that. And phase contrast is all about just uh, visualizing the cell. Phase quantitative phase imaging is about getting this quantitative map of what the cell's uh, refractive index and shape is. So it can be really useful. Um, so you can do surface profiling it with it. If you know you have a constant refractive index, then you can just uh, profile your surface at will uh, and get, you know, sub wavelength accuracy. This is an x-ray. Here's your typical uh, x-ray image that you see is actually absorption. So your bones absorb a lot of x-rays. So when you do take an x-ray of your body, you see bones very clearly because they're absorbing a lot relative to the rest of your body. If you were to take a phase contrast image, this is a mouse, um, you don't see your bones so well, but you start to see a lot of the soft tissues. So this black arrow points to uh, this mouse's esophagus and you can start to see just different things. So it's a contrast mechanism in that uh, it allows you to see different things. So follow so on. Sure, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so mathematically, you can think about it as um, representing your electric field E as having an amplitude A and a phase phi. And what you measure is intensity I, which is up to value squared. So Generally, you don't measure phase because it's in the it's in the exponential here, and so you have to put it through some optical system that that converts that phi like exponential into a real part that can be measured by intensity measurements. 
Okay, so the, the next question was, what are the potential future developments of uh, phase contrast? Yeah, uh, so phase contrast has been around for many decades. It's very popular. Biological uh, bright field microscopes almost always have a, a phase contrast option. Um, so if you want to do phase contrast in a biological microscope, you usually need some, some extra hardware. So, uh, and it comes with a lot of bright field microscopes because so many people use it. It's one of the most popular non-fluorescent microscope modalities. And so normally what you need to do is you need to modify your illumination pathway. So you would put like, this is a turret that you would put in that has different condensers. So condenser is part of your illumination unit and you put these different ring illumination masks into the condenser. Um, and what they do is they, so, so we talked about phase contrast shifting the DC term. In commercial microscopes, it's usually shifting this ring of not, not the DC term, but some other uh, spatial frequency. And so you put this in your illumination pathway, and then you also need to have um, this phase plate in your objective. So you need a specialized objective. So it would normally say PHC on the objective, indicating that it's a phase contrast objective. And you would take that phase contrast objective and match it up to one of these um, condenser phase stops. And you have to align them carefully in the microscope, and then you have a phase contrast microscope. So this is all um, kind of annoying because you have to physically put in new elements and align them up together. And it's also quite expensive. So uh, every objective might cost you a few thousand dollars um, and you need a separate objective for every magnification. So if you want a 10X objective and a 20X objective, both in phase contrast, those are separate objectives you have to buy and they're separate from the non-phase contrast uh, objectives that you would want to buy. Um, so alignment matters. If you don't get the alignment right, your images could look terrible. Um, the other commercial way of doing phase contrast right now is called DIC, differential interference contrast. It uses polarization to, to shear the wave front so you can see phase. So here's another example of cells that would be transparent, but now I can see them. Okay, so I think that the new sort of like the future is doing quantitative phase measurement. And in research, this has been done for a long time, a couple decades, people have been working on various methods for quantitative phase. But I'll say that I think that it's better than phase contrast. So DIC and PHC are phase contrast. So they can you can visualize things, information about a, a phase object, but uh, quantitative phase is a quantitative map of what the phase delays are at every point in space. So this is telling me how much phase delay is a sort of like a physical quantity. Um, uh, so I think this is going to be extremely useful for biology because it's quantitative information and things that you can get out of it, for example, are you can do cell tracking. So you see in this phase contrast picture, it's really like high pass filtered. You, you can see the edges of the cell, but you can't really get a sense of the actual physical shape of the cell, which you can in the quantitative phase. Um, if anyone has ever tried to do automated analysis on phase contrast images, there's a whole page on the, the cell profile or open source website uh, that you can't do um, segmentation. So you can't like segment out which cells are which or do cell counting on phase contrast images, but you can do that on quantitative phase images if they're good quantitative phase images. So this is sort of like medium term in the sense that uh, there already are quantitative phase microscopes commercially available. They're all pretty much like little startup companies. Um, unfortunately, almost all of them are really expensive and a lot of them are a separate microscope instead of making it what I think we should be doing is making attachments to existing microscopes because biologists might have their favorite Nikron microscope with the eyepiece that they like and a good focusing mechanism. If we can make the phase uh, capabilities be a simple add-on, it makes it much more attractive to them. So this LED array microscope was all aimed at that and I do think that uh, it's working its way into becoming a commercial, commercially available. And one of the big advantages of it is that you can swap between bright field, dark field, phase contrast just by changing the LEDs. You don't need new hardware and you it's very fast. So you don't need to like physically move things around. You don't need to physically align. So we can do phase just by lighting up two different patterns on the LED array. 
Um, and then you can do extremely fast quantitative phase imaging. So normally it would require four images. You might need moving parts, etc. So now we don't need moving parts. Um, we don't need to align anything. It doesn't really, we can computationally correct for any misalignment. So uh, all of this work of aligning the, the phase contrast objectives to the condenser units is totally irrelevant. And now we can use those objectives that we have already instead of buying specialized new ones. So I think that's like the future for like in use. And I like very much look forward to uh, seeing if and when um, these methods become like, commercially popular. So they're commercially available. They're not commercially popular yet. And I really think they're better. And it's just a matter of convincing biologists to to make the change. So we have to be that much better than what what they currently use, which is I think the issue right now is trying to be better enough that it's worth changing or simple enough and cheap enough that it's not a big deal to change over to these new methods. OK, so a, a difference between incremental and, and some kind of step change, I guess, is what's yeah. what's required. Ben Moon has a question in your discussion about Raleigh resolution criterion. You mentioned that the 26 percent dip in intensity between two point sources is usually sufficient to distinguish the two point sources. Can you comment on situations which would require a greater separation of the sources to tell them apart? Yeah, so you can see my screen, right? Yes. You can see this. Point. OK, so this Raleigh criteria is uh, it's just one criteria. There's a whole bunch of different ways of defining resolution. And there's lots of people who will argue one was better than the other, etc. Um, this one's popular because it has this nice simple equation, 0.61 lambda over NA. So um, if your NA is one, then about half your wavelength is about what resolution you can get. And it's just a nice rule of thumb. In, in practice, of course, like if you're saying resolved means telling, noticing a dip between these two uh, peaks, well, uh, say it's 26%. That's a pretty good margin of error. That means you can have noise up to 26% and still potentially see that there's a dip here. So it's all about your noise, right? If you have no noise, I only need like what a, a tiny an epsilon fraction of a percent of a dip in order to to resolve or distinguish these two points. Um, if I have a lot of noise, like if my image is uh, pure noise, then I need a much bigger um, dip between these two points to properly resolve them. So it's really like important to know that this is just a rule of thumb. I had a really fun conversation once. One of the students in my class sent me pictures. So he set up a resolution target and then put his camera a certain distance away with a certain aperture and showed that he was actually able to resolve things better than the Raleigh suggested and was wondering if he was doing super resolution, etc. But no, this is just uh, you you can of course do a better than this if you have no noise and, and you uh, have simple simple objects etc. So uh, you can also do worse than this in a in a real system. So it's uh, it, it's just it's just a simple like approximation to what resolution you should expect. And also know that if you're doing microscopy. Uh, this is going by the NA of the microscope's objective uh, is going to tell you the resolution, but if it's a bad objective, then you're going to have aberrations and you might not actually do so as well as this as the NA predicts you would do because you're losing information across those higher spatial frequencies, which are what gives you the high resolution. Do some of these um, <clears throat> criteria favor one microscopic technique over another and and is there is there a tendency for for some uh, promoters of a particular technology to want to use one criterion over another? Uh, I'm sure yes. Uh, I don't know if I can give a specific example. Um, so phase imaging is very interesting because uh, these bumps here that I'm showing you are the intensity bumps, right? But then if these two if these two peaks are resulting from coherent interaction, so if the two points that created these peaks actually coherently interfere with each other, then interference effects sort of like break all the rules. And 
some people will say that phased images uh, effectively have better resolution than they should. It's not really true. Um, but the, these dips will change drastically if these two points are coherently uh, interfered with each other. So this is really based on an assumption that these points are incoherent and that you're going to just add their intensity. So incoherent addition means you have these two uh, oscillating peaks, which are the airy disk functions, and they just simply add in intensity. If they add in complex field, which is what happens in the coherent case, it's totally uh, it totally depends on the phase difference between them, what this this uh, valley or and peaks will be. So absolutely, the criterion matters. Um, if you look at like the spatial bandwidth, I think that's probably one that, uh, like, if you just take the Fourier transform of your of your results and look at their bandwidth, that's one metric for resolution criteria. That's probably a good one to use if you have a lot of aberrations because. You'll have those spatial frequencies, but you're not getting, they're not helping you to get better resolution. I don't know that I've seen a lot of cases of people intentionally using their, the criteria that makes them look good. What I have seen a lot of is um, misuse of this resolution target. So this US Air Force test target is a is a common way to, to quantify your resolution and um, there's two ways to look at this. So if I'm trying to say, if I'm saying I can resolve three lines here, then uh, so say I, I found the one that I can resolve the smallest three lines, and then how do I say what resolution is it? Is it the separation between those lines, or is it the sort of like center to center, uh, like peak to peak separation, which will be twice as far? So if these lines are a millimeter big each, right, then they have a millimeter blank space between them. So if I can resolve them, is my resolution one millimeter or is it two millimeters? Because the the lines are separate are on a spacing grid of two millimeters. So that's a factor of two in resolution. That totally depends on how you choose to report it. And you, I'm okay with you using either one, but you should tell your your users which one you're using. Uh, otherwise, you end up with this factor of two difference um, that matters. That's a big difference in resolution. Okay, the next uh, uh, the next question refers to uh, refers to lecture one. So this aperture stop and numerical aperture. Uh, so the question is a, a small correction. Uh, refractive index n in the formula for n a, where n a is equal to n sine theta, is not the refractive index of the lens. It is the refractive index of the medium between the lens and the sample. Usually this medium is air and n equals one, so the possible NA is less than one. To increase the NA to greater than one, immersion medium with N greater than one, water or oil, as you mentioned previously, is used and resolution will be improved. So. Um, yes, that's all correct, but I don't, I don't think I labeled it wrong, did I? The N is outside of the lens, so. This, the N in the in the schematic is outside the lens, so it is intended to refer to the surrounding medium. OK. Um, Meng Li is asking for an imager, uh, microscopy or hyperspectral camera. If the target is not in focus, the image is both spatially and spectrally blurry. But if the target surface is glossy and shiny, can the specular signal reflected from the target surface also be degraded due to target not in focus? So if you have a glossy, shiny target, that's out of focus. It's a little bit weird, right? Because if it's acting glossy and shiny, it's basically acting like a mirror. And so, what does in focus mean if it's acting like a mirror? It'll, it, you're going to be like seeing something that's elsewhere. I assume you're talking about reflection mode microscopy. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for this. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, really I guess sure it, could be a bumpy, it could be a bumpy surface that's that's um, an optically bumpy surface that that's still shiny, I suppose. And specular, but right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then definitely your image will be degraded or weird. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good answer, but sorry. 
Uh, Priya Anuj wants to know, um, well, thanks for the amazing lectures. Many people are saying that, so I'm skipping that bit, Laura, sorry. Um, <laughs> it, it was mentioned that we can make, uh, we can, okay, get a better resolution by increasing NA. However, this could also increase the background noise entering the system and decrease the signal to noise resolution. Is this a problem generally? Um, so, yes. It's not necessarily that it increased the background noise, but uh, aberrations tend to happen at high NAs, right? So the high angle uh, parts of the system tend to get hit by aberrations a lot more. This is why high NA objectives are very expensive because they have to have a lot of elements in them to correct for all of the aberrations that are created when you go to high angles. And uh, in photography, this happens as well, and there in photography, when you buy a, an SLR camera, it has you can shut down the aperture. Big part of that is to control how much light you get. Um, so in that case, uh, and in microscopy, as you open that aperture, um, you're actually getting more light. So that helps your SNR. You're right that you're getting you might be getting more garbage because you have more aberrations at those high angles. And very often in photography, we actually shut down the aperture. Um, to kill aberrations so that we can get a clearer image. Same in microscopy, you can close the aperture stop um, and sometimes it will reduce the aberrations and you can actually get better images sometimes. This is unlikely in a commercial microscope because they're designed um, uh, to, to get rid of those aberrations. Like they wouldn't offer you a, a 1NA objective if it didn't, if it performed worse at like full fully open then partially closed they would they would cut off those frequencies for you um where you actually we do see this true is uh we work with some people in vision sciences who are imaging through your eye so your eyes lens is kind of a bad lens sometimes particularly if you have bad eyes and you can image the point spread function of your eye and it actually sometimes gets better as you close your pupil um so that's like the only case i can think of where where you do this like in your sort of in real life only because uh, most people won't sell you a lens that uh, that performs better at a lower aperture because they would just cut off that aperture um, where you might see it is if you're operating the lens off focus if you're operating the lens you know in a way it wasn't designed for then you might actually be able to close your aperture and have a higher resolution effective resolution because of the aberrations Right, that, that's a really interesting effect with the eye, isn't it? That you get higher resolution um, as as the aperture closes. Um, Sometimes so it depends on your eye. <laughs> and, and then there's so my, the, the light yeah. intensity, yeah, and, and so on. So yeah, and the signal. Yeah, I think with, and, yeah, I think with your eye, your pupil size determines the amount of light. That's like more most the most important thing it does. Um, and you know, in photography closing up the aperture or opening it is often to control the depth of field. So all these things are really related, um, but certainly um, it matters for aberrations as well. Right. The, the other thing that in photography and, and other systems that are done automatically for us and we, we sort of forget about is they they vary the, the integration time, right? So right. you don't have to worry about saturation and you, uh, you know, if, if there isn't enough light, they'll open up uh, the shutter for a longer period of time and 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 so on. Uh, so you, you you never have to worry about this sort of saturation and that sort of thing and and using your dynamic range, I suppose, properly. Most of that is done, especially nowadays in in very clever cameras, right? Um, OK, uh, very good. So uh, Robert Stafford Williams wants to know in choosing a material for the diffuser layer of the lensless diffuser camera, are there popular properties or features that help or hinder image reconstruction or are all materials that diffuse light as good as each other? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So material wise, we don't think about that too much. Most of our diffusers are made out of plastic like PMMA. Uh, we think a lot about the fabrication of the diffusers like we're trying to um, we're trying to make diff right now we're trying to do like end-to-end -end optimization of the whole system to design the best possible diffuser surface shape. So basically, like if you think about the diffuser, 
um, what it's doing, acting like a phase mask. So it's delaying the phase by an amount proportional to the surface shape and the refractive index of the material. So the refractive index of the material, we just sort of accept that it's going to be around whatever plastic is. It's about 1.5. Um, and then we design the surface shape to control the diffuser properties. And that's really important. We can do a lot better by using these optimized diffusers. So um, my undergrads made this cool tutorial about making a diffuser cam with a piece of scotch tape on a Raspberry Pi sensor. And that was super fun and cool. And it's you can do the tutorial. A few people have done it and sent us pictures. It works. It's really uh, it's really neat that they were able to do it with scotch tape, which we call opportunistic imaging. But in reality, if you want it to work well, you should use a, a design diffuser and you should place it at a distance that's sort of like carefully thought about. So the, the distance part is part of the design. So how far away are you going to place this thing from the sensor? And in our like later versions and, and more like high end versions of diffuser cam, we sort of very carefully place it, um, you know, maybe I think it's like seven millimeters from the sensor. Uh, and then we design the the surface shape to be optimal. And optimal um, is very dependent on what you're looking at. So if you have a microscopy sample that's extremely sparse, you want a different diffuser pattern than if you have a really complicated or bright. So if you have really bright light, then you don't need to worry about noise. And so you would uh, make diffuser diffusers with, um, with very few bumps on them. Um, if you if you have really dim light, then you then sorry with more bumps on them. If you have really dim light, then you would have less bumps because you want to concentrate the light into fewer spots, and that costs you multiplexing, so you won't be able to, you know, solve for higher dimensions as easily. So these things are all being traded off in each of the designs, and the whole system is extremely nonlinear, meaning that it depends on what object you're looking at. So when we design, we're designing like for a particular situation, like for a particular field of view, vo volumetric field of view, and for a particular type of sample. Um, so uh, we're currently sort of in the process and we have that all set up. We can do these sort of specific designs for applications and we're working on a couple of specific applications that we're designing to. Great. Are, are you planning to show something or? Um, I? No, I think it'll take me longer to find it than it's worth. <laughs> OK, so I think we should take a break here because we promised people a break at seven and you've already been working for a, quite hard for an hour. Um, and we have many more questions to come back to. We are less than halfway through. So uh, back at 7.30 or in 30 minutes for people in the rest of the world. Um, that when I say 7.30, I am talking about UK Ireland time, just Google Dublin time if, you, if you're confused. OK, thank you very much. Back in 30 minutes. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks.
Okay, so I guess we're back. <clears throat> so I'm just waiting for Aaron to bring us live, I think. And Laura, are you with us? Yep. Hi. Great. So I, I guess we can we can even get going. Um, it looks like we're live, so people can hear us. <clears throat> Good. So. I postponed one question uh, there, uh, which was early on, but it was about the fourth lecture. When it comes to the fourth lecture, can you develop the idea that stands behind the algorithm of quasi second order optimization, the Gauss-Newton method, and how it applies to the considered application? Yeah, um, good question. So. Uh, in the break, I saw this question. I was looking for a good illustration of how Gauss-Newton works. Um, I didn't find one, but I found a good explanation for second order optimization, of which this is um, the type. So first order optimization, um, you're trying to find, so you have some loss function or cost function. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yes, I can do. Okay. So you have some loss function versus like this W1 is like whatever parameter you're optimizing. So you're optimizing W1, trying to find the best W1 to give the smallest loss or the smallest cost function. And typically when you optimize something, you take its derivative and set it to zero, right? Because you're looking for you're looking for the point when it's a minimum. And so it should have a derivative of zero at that point. This is a, obviously a non-convex fu function because it goes up and down and then up and down again. Um, so uh, all you might get stuck in a local minima, meaning that you're going to find the the point where the gradient goes to zero. Um, in this case, it'll take you to one of these dips, uh, but it might not be the global minimum in the sense that there might be one of the di other dips that's actually uh, gives you a lower value. But you can't get there because you just took the first order because you just took this uh, gradient optimization. So this is how we do it anyways, even when we have a non-convex function most of the time. Um, so you, you start with some guess of this W, um, this so this red dot, and then you take the derivative at that point. So you take the derivative of the loss function with respect to W1 at that point, and that basically tells you which direction to go in, right? So in this case, if you start from where the red dot is, it'll tell you to go uh, it'll change it, tell you to change your W1, you know, towards the right uh, by a certain amount. So there's a step size that tells you how far to go. Um, and then you'll pick this new W1 and it'll give you a, a better value for the loss function. And you keep doing that until you get to the minimum, um, the minimum where your gradient is zero. And you assume that if your gradient is zero, then I'm in a minimum. And so I should stop because it's only going to get worse if I keep going. OK, so that's first order optimization. Second order optimization means that you don't just take the, the first order gradient, but you also look at the second order gradient. So if you start from on this bottom picture here, if you start from the red dot and you take the first order gradient, it's going to tell you to move to a certain place. Um, if you take the second order gradient, that means you're not just looking at the slope of the curve there. You're looking also at the curvature of this curve. So the curvature gives you more information about what's happening on that curve, right? So this blue, um, this blue line here is represented by it is like a second order approximation to the curve at that point where the red dot is. And if you use that, and then you choose basically like the minimum of this this bowl set by the the blue line, then you're going to get a better. You're going to like sort of stay closer to the actual function line, and that's better. So it makes your optimization more efficient and if you're dealing typically uh, the way people think about second order optimization is that it, it it gets you to the minimum faster so you can take fewer iterations usually but um, in general you would think that it should get you to the same minimum um, so you take fewer iterations but now you need to compute both the first order gradient and the second order gradient um, and so uh, you have to decide whether it's worth it in terms of is that extra computation going to take longer than it's worth in terms of how much it saves you iterations. When we have these non-convex non problems, uh, like phase retrieval most definitely is, um, sometimes it actually gets you to better answers. So it can 
you can take a better estimate of your next uh, W and it might pop you, get you like past one of these, these humps and get you into a more global, towards the global minimum. Uh, it's not super clear why it does that in the phase retrieval case, but it does seem to give you better answers. If not, it gives you answers with fewer iterations and we actually can go faster. Okay, so we don't go faster just by taking the, the second order gradient. So when we're talking about um, like a big vector, like an image, maybe it has a million pixels in it, then taking the second order derivative results in a huge matrix called the Hessian. So second order derivative uh, uh, of a vector is going to be a Hessian, which is a matrix. And if I have n points in my vector, that Hessian is going to be of size n squared. So that's a lot of things to compute and it's a big matrix to store. And so that creates really big problems when we're doing imaging stuff. Um, so doing second order optimization, which we called Newton's method, is really impractical and it's not going to be faster because you have to compute so many things to get that Hessian. And it's, uh, although it does help you get a better, uh, sort of a better next guess at this parameter W1, which in our case is the phase we're trying to solve for. Um, so the Gauss-Newton approach um, is an approximation to Newton's method in that instead of calculating the entire Hessian, uh, so my way of explaining is to think that if this Hessian uh, represents all of the different combinations of derivatives with respect to uh, different elements of the vector, then the diagonal element is the most important and, or the diagonal and the things near the diagonal are the most important. So the Gauss-Newton method only looks at um, in, in our implementation, we only look at the diagonal along this big Hessian. So we use the first order derivative and the diagonal of the second order Hessian matrix. And that's how we update our, do our like uh, cost function update. Uh, and that's pretty computationally efficient because it's just, um, you know, calculating n more things, uh, but they help a lot with getting a better answer. This is like a long winded uh, explanation, but hopefully that helps. This is all like optimization theory and that's uh, not, not things that I'm a super expert in, but you can find for our particular situation for, for Fourier tachography, I think we have a, a full derivation in the paper by Li Hao Ye, which is called experimental something or other for Fourier tachography. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Um, all right. So did Aaron want to say something? Um, yeah, just uh, we missed one question there um, just before the question we started back on from Eric. Oh yeah, the lateral resolution of a lens is straightforward to measure. How can we measure the axial resolution or point spread function? Yeah, so point spread function is pretty easy. So if you want to measure a lateral point spread function, you put a point in your system and then you measure the 2D lateral measurement, right? So if you want to measure axial, you can basically put a point in your system and then measure the axial intensity just by taking images at different focus positions. So you can take a stack of images at different focus positions and that'll give you your 3 to that 3D cube of data you get is basically your 3D point spread function. If you want to figure out resolution from it, you could, if, you, if you're talking about bandwidth, you can do a, a Fourier transform and look at the, the bandwidth along the, the th three dimensions. So now you have an axial dimension added. Um, for our diffuser cam project, we uh, to, to measure lateral resolution, we wanted the two point resolution, largely because we used an inverse problem with a nonlinear regularizer. So the nonlinear regularizers can take a, a blob and approximate it as a spike. Uh, and it, you'll, your PSF will look great after you, if you include the reconstruction in it. Um, but you won't be able to resolve two points that are close together. So we wanted to look at two point resolution. So um, what we do is we put two points closer and closer together laterally and then we reconstructed them and then looked if we got a like rally criterion dip between them. So for axial, we did exactly the same thing. We put two points axially and we measured an image and then we reconstructed the image and then said, can I resolve them in the axial dimension? Um, so it, it's very similar. You just sometimes you need extra measurements like the focus stack. Sorry, uh, while solving the ill poseness based on which criteria those sparsity measure, uh, matrices are selected, 
Does it depend on the resolution requirements or the measurements? Um, yeah, so uh, you can read our paper on this. It's like fairly complicated for uh, for a particular situation. So if you're asking um, what type of sparsity we used, uh, let me pull up a slide for people who who maybe forget. So I'll show you our inverse problem here. Share my screen. Yeah, so here's our inverse problem um, for the diffuser cam. And this is the this last term here with a sparsity basis is the term that enforces or regularizes the image to enforce sparsity. Uh, we need this if we want to do three dimensional measurements. So um, Almost all of the results I show are using a sparsity basis function of total variation or TV sparsity, which is an assumption that the gradient of the 3D sample is sparse. So if you take a 3D gradient, that it'll be relatively sparse or has a lot of zeros in it. We chose that just by trial and error. We just tried different sparsity basis sets and saw which ones gave good results. So it's totally heuristic. Um, you should probably try a few on your particular system. It's also tricky because you need to tune. Like, for example, this lambda out front is a regularization tuning parameter. So you've got hyperparameters that you'll need to tune. And so it can get really tricky to figure out which one is the best one. But um, TV is a popular one. It seems to work on a lot of naturalish scenes or native sparsity. Um, or if you happen to know it, wavelet sparsity is another one we tried. No no real explanation why one works better than the other in our particular case. Uh, so if you have a, an object that can be decomposed into one of these sparsity basis sets easily, then try that one first. But uh, this is sadly a fairly black magic, and I'm pretty excited about some recent research going on these days. In, in um, So there's like re research in trying to optimize the, the hyperparameters of these optimizations, but also research in trying to uh, optimize the basis, these sparsity basis sets, or, or like basically these priors that you're making. And there's been some cool results using like, you can train a machine learning algorithm to try to learn them, you can do dictionary learning. Um, we're not using anything too fancy yet, but we would love to try it in the future. Great, we have a lot of questions coming in. So um, this one from Sweden, are, are there any uh, contrast mechanisms in microscopy that go well together, e.g. by giving complementary information? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that was actually one of the arguments we made with our LED array is that we can simultaneously capture bright field, dark field phase contrast, and then they all just give you different information about the sample. Uh, and one of my students is working on a really big project. He just collected a couple terabytes, many terabytes of data with all of these different contrast mechanisms that are easily available. And he's trying to look at things like cell classification or um, or various different sort of like task based uh, microscopy goals. And he's trying to figure out, you know, for cell classification, what are the contrast mechanisms that matter? Um, so he's doing like a big machine learning, try to figure out what's important uh, when. So we're trying to figure that out. It's sort, of, sort of like intuitively can think about, I think of fluorescence imaging as functional imaging that you fluorescently tag parts of specific uh, parts of the cell that you want to look at how they function. And then phase Im imaging, for example, gives you structural information because it's the shape and density that that plays into the phase measurement. So I think those are pretty complementary, seeing the structural information next to the functional information of what a particular molecule is doing inside the cell. Um, so that maybe that's a good example. If you think about dark field imaging, that's picking up on all like your high frequency sharp edges um, or scattering uh, edges, whereas like bright field and phase microscopy you can look at low frequency, like sort of blobular stuff. So it depends on what you're doing, but I do think there's probably a lot of um, things that could be done really interestingly for specific biological tasks, choosing your contrast mechanisms. And that's a part of what we like to do by making them all readily available on one system. 
So can we define uh, an effective NA for dark field microscopy and will the highest resolution attainable be different compared to bright field microscopy? Oh, good question. So uh, if I think about dark field, let's see if I can pull up a picture. Um, so if you think about that, the NA for dark field is the same as for bright field because that's set by uh, your um, that's set by your numerical aperture of the, your objective. So I like to look at this picture that I'm showing now. Um, so this green circle, each of these green circle circles represents like the the area of spatial frequencies captured by a given an objective with a given NA. And so all of these images have the same spatial frequency bandwidth, meaning that like the maximum, uh, the smallest feature visible on all of these images is the same size. So it doesn't change your resolution in that sense. However, it's interesting because if you look at like this dark field picture taken with an off axis illumination LED, then it picks up on higher spatial frequencies. So if you're thinking about the sample spatial frequencies, then I am getting information about these higher spatial frequencies. So it's not super resolution information, but it's certainly uh, information about the spatial frequencies that uh, would give me super resolution. So it's a little bit confusing, um, but that's sort of like how I think about it. I'm not sure how to define. I think your NA of your dark field is just the NA of the objective if you want to define it. But it, it's also weird because it it picks up these different higher spatial frequencies of your sample. OK, how can contrast agents like plasmonic gold nanoparticles be imaged using dark field microscopy? Um, so what I, I don't know too much about this topic, but what I, I mean, like if you put in nanoparticles, they're smaller than the diffraction limit. So when you use dark field microscopy, um, you can light them up. Uh, you're going to light them up with a circle, uh, like a points mid function of size set by the numerical aperture. Um, but I guess you could say they, they're lighting up. So if you think about dark field, actually that might be a good segue, is to, to think about the dark field as a contrast mechanism. Then think about how you're lighting this thing up from the side. Uh, so I think in one of the lectures I showed, one of my lectures I showed this picture of light coming in a room from the side and lighting up the dust. This is how you can think about dark field imaging. Um, so, uh, so if your if your particles are uh, small enough that they scatter light to angle large angles then my light comes in through the window at a particular angle. And then if the light scatters in all directions and I capture it from one of the directions that doesn't get the main beam of light, but gets the scattered light, then basically all the particles have to do is be scattering light to angles high enough that they're captured, um, given the difference in angle between the illumination and the, um, between the illumination and the detection. So you're illuminating from such a high angle that you don't capture that illumination light, but you do capture the scattered light. So anything that scatters to high angles is going to show up in dark field microscopy. I don't think it has anything particular to do with the plasmonic nature of the particles. OK, uh, how do you design or optimize phase masks? Yeah, great question. So we have to set this up as a big optimization pattern, a uh, big optimization problem. Um, where we're going to like take a derivative of the, a cost function that describes like the image quality. So we have to set a metric for image quality. Maybe it's just the like L2 error in the reconstruction. Uh, like you can, you can, you need some ground truth, right? So we're going to do this with uh, the machine learning methods that uh, we train with some ground truth. So the ground truth might be just from like a two photon microscope, etc. In practice, we do it all in simulation where we have the ground truth uh, and we simulate the measurements we would get for a particular object. And then we need to be able to 
to basically like back propagate through that optimization, we need to take a derivative um, with respect to the phase mask parameters. And the hard part of this is that if you're trying to design the surface shape of a phase mask, for example, that has like n pixels, um, you need to be able to take that derivative and you need to uh, you need to be able to do this optimization, but it's pretty large scale because you need to solve for so many things. So in practice, what we do is we parameterize it as um, a set of lenslets, and then we optimize for the the radius of curvature of the lenslets, basically like the focal length and the position of the lenslets, and then an offset, which tells the offset uh, sets their clear aperture size. And so we have a paper on archive right now that just that goes through all of that. Um, how we specifically design and optimize. But in the first iterations of things, we were just doing it heuristically, sort of just um, guessing based on knowing the physics, what would be the best phase masks. And then the original one was with a diffuser that was really an off-the-shelf diffuser that was totally opportunistic that we just used what we had to see if it would work. Okay, at uh, Kizari wants to know, um, in the case of using coherent light source and imaging a sample of certain scattering level, we end up with speckled patterns. So do the contrast mechanisms still work in this case? Yeah, great question. And a lot of them do not work. So like fluorescence doesn't work, doesn't care about coherent. Well, you can you can excite fluorescence as coherent light, but um, if you're using coherent light and have all this scattering, then it's going to create all kinds of contrast that you didn't really want, right? And so that's basically why people don't uh, don't use coherent light very much for a lot of things in microscopy. So I would say yes, that it can mess up with mess up a lot of the, these contrast mechanisms. Ben Moon wants to know how does the sensitivity of phase contrast microscopy uh, to small changes in refractive index compared to the sensitivity of OCT, which also relies on refractive index changes to provide contrast. Yeah, so OCT I would classify as one of the quantitative phase imaging methods. Um, it's a, after something different, usually they're going after 3D, but uh, it is a phase imaging method. Um, fundamentally, it is interferometry, um, so it's like using coherence gating but the coherence gain is relying on looking at the interferometric contrast. So, uh, so it should have a, a similar sensitivity limit as all of these other quantitative phase methods. If you want to compare which ones are actually better, then uh, you need to look at all the geometries and, and actual parameters of each system. So I'm not going to venture to say which ones are better. It probably depends on their parameters and the situation. But OCT uh, does very well because it takes a lot of data and so it can average a lot as well. I see. So so does that explain why um, we rarely see the other micro well, the microscopies as we generally talk about them, um, phase microscopies used at the kind of depth that you would use OCT in the skin or in the brain, like one millimeter. Um, rarely see. Uh, that's that's because of scattering. So. Uh, the OCT does a very good job of, of, the, of going through scattering because it, the coherence gating rejects light that was scattered and, and doesn't fit with its model. So I think that's why you don't use other phase methods at depth. OK, that's a nice answer. Uh, so would the bokeh effect uh, mentioned in lecture one also be possible by using your phone? Or do you need a camera with a lens where you can change the focus? Uh, the fact that your phone auto focuses shouldn't be a problem. You can force it to focus on a particular place, right? You can usually click to do that. I've never tried it, but I think it'd be really hard because you would, because the aperture in your phone is really physically small. It's on, I don't know how big it is, but millimeters, right? So you need to like, if you want it to be like a heart shape, you need to print that heart shape really small, and then you need to try to get it into the aperture plane of the camera, which I assume is inaccessible. So my iPhone has like this glass over the top. So if I just put it there, that's not going to be the aperture plane. And so I think that it probably won't work. You could rip it apart and potentially do it, but I've never seen anyone do it. So I, and I suspect it would be really difficult. 
Yeah, I thought that Photonation or Xperi, the people who do most of the, the work on those phones, had had done some work on that. And I thought it was included in commercial devices, but I've never used it, so I, I don't know. So have a look. Maybe they've done something. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so Luigi wants to know, um, uh, in the lensless camera, how do you obtain the point spread function for all points in space without calibration? Um, okay, let me go to slides for that. Uh, so this is my diffuser cam slide. And how do we do calibration? So um, this is the real key to it, is that if you move a point laterally in the scene, that classic pattern just simply shifts. So we don't need to calibrate every point in the scene. So especially for the 3D problem, um, it would just be like computationally and acquisition-wise infeasible to capture and uh, like uh, like the impulse function for every single point in the scene, every position in 3D. They just like we reconstruct sometimes. Um, no, I don't want to get this wrong, but you know, like tens of millions of voxels, and so. Capturing that many images is crazy, and the inverse problem would be crazy. So this fact that that this thing is a pure shift means that we don't need to capture the the point spread function at every position laterally. We can just capture one and then predict the shifts that would happen as you move laterally. And we capture that one simply by we put like you can just turn on your iPhone flashlight and hold it as a point source in your scene and capture the point spread function. It doesn't even need to really be centered. That'll just be your zero zero position. So this is super convenient. It also means like this forward model or a matrix is convolutional. So you know we capture say this one point spread function, which is a column of the a matrix, and we know the point spread function at all the other positions simply by shifting it. So there's a little bit of a caveat that the pattern goes off the edge of the sensor, which is why we put the aperture on the system is so that we can capture a single point spread function that almost fills the sensor, and then as it shifts, you don't have other parts of the point spread function entering the system, because um, then we would have to capture all of those as well, uh, which you could do just by capturing a few points, but we just wanted to capture just exactly one, and so we put the aperture on to make everything easier. And then for 3D, you need to look at depths, right? Um, so this is really convenient as well, that as I move the point axially, that caustic pattern simply scales. Um, so it's doing a little more than scaling, it's changing a little bit, so we actually do capture at a few different depths, um, but you theoretically could predict all of the depths from one. It would just be not quite as accurate as you move further away. So that uh, helps you predict the response at all the different depths, and then these, these patterns are simply going to shift with lateral motion. Um, so you really only need one. In practice, we use a few more than one. Um, and what was I going to say? Yeah, so uh, I guess that's all I need to say about it. Um, so we skipped over one question there. Um, I might just ask it if that's OK. Sure. Um, it says, in general, to reconstruct the phase with a 4F imaging system, several intensity images are measured by moving the camera or sample. At what distance limit the camera or the sample should be moved to avoid the problem image registration on the acquired intensities? Thank you. OK, so I think you're talking about um, like phase retrieval from through focus images, because sometimes we just change the system, right? Like the LED array, we just change the illumination patterns on the system, which is a big advantage because there's no moving parts. If you want to solve for phase from defocus, then you have to create defocus by either moving the camera or the sample. I think that's what you're talking about. And so uh, if you defocus by too much, then yes, you're going to have problems. So in a non telecentric uh, system, like not a perfect 4F system, then when you go off focus, the magnification is also changing. And so that's going to cause that does cause big problems. So when we've tried to do this for X-ray, we've run into that problem where um, the it's not just the focus, but also the whole thing is demagnifying or magnifying 
and that you have to start to you have to register to each other. I don't know that we ever did that very successfully. We had other problems with that project, but in a typical like infinity corrected microscope, which is a telecentric 4F system, then usually you're only focusing by a few microns or tens of microns, and so you don't have to worry about the registration. Uh, if you have a bad stage or something and, and it's laterally moving, then you should register the, Im the, the images laterally, which is like usually not a problem because it's usually shifting by a pixel or two pixels or less. Um, and you can just use like, you know, off the shelf image registration algorithms to do that. So uh, you'll run into problems with like the data being useless before you run into registration problems in a lot of cases. <laughs> OK, so how can we calculate the phase information in speckle imaging where the light is illuminated on uh, surface and captured at different angles? Is it possible to get phase information if the illumination is from narrow bandwidth, example 530 nanometers? So, so phase is, if you write the equation for phase, it's the refractive index contrast. Um, times distance, and it's all multiplied by 2 pi by lambda. So phase depends on wavelength. And so having a single narrow bandwidth, single wavelength setup is usually preferable for phase imaging because then you have, you know, if you put in a sample and you want to measure its phase, you're measuring its phase at a particular wavelength. If the if the illumination is more broadband, then what you what you get out of the phase imaging system is basically the spectrally weighted phase. Um, so it's better to stick to one wavelength. You also can usually get higher contrast if you all have all one wavelength. Um, so speckle is speckle is like all these bright and dark points. They're, they are interference patterns. So the bright points are constructive interference. The dark parts are destructive interference. And so if you measure the phase of a speckle pattern, it's just going to be this like wildly changing uh, phase pattern, and that's what creates the speckle intensity be through interference effects. Um, so yeah, so you can do that, and uh, I guess like if you wanted to then go and relate that to the surface shape, you have to be you have to be able to trust that 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 the sort of like changes in phase came directly from the surface. OK, consider two samples of the same geometric shape. This is a bit like an exam <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, one, one of the samples is primarily absorbent and the other is primarily phase. What difference would I observe between the images of the two samples? OK, so it depends on what contrast mechanism you're using. Um, if you use a just bright field, just a regular microscope with regular illumination, then the absorbent one will have dark places where it's absorbing and bright places where it's not absorbing. The phase one will just be invisible. Um, if you're using phase contrast, then uh, you're going to see bright and dark according to the phase contrast, but wherever it's absorbent, it will be dark. So um, that's actually a problem with phase contrast, like PHC or DIC. When you get dark pixels in your image, you don't know if they're because the light was absorbed there or if it's because of destructive interference that that's part of the phase contrast. So that's why we call it non-quantitative because uh, you have this ambiguity. You don't know the difference. If I do quantitative phase, then I should be able to separate out, you know, a, a absorbent, a, an absorption image and a phase image, which are separate where um, where it's absorbing, it'll be dark where it's absorbing and then in the phase image it will you'll just get the phase delays irrespective of how bright the image was there as long as it's not black of course if it's black Thanks. like if the light is completely absorbed there's there is no phase there's no defined phase there so silvera has a second question for four marks uh, can an absorbent sample <laughs> be described even partially in three dimensions by coupling an appropriate algorithm to the images obtained by Z scanning with a bright field microscope. Yeah, so I think what you're asking is like if I have a, a 3D sample that has some 3D distribution of absorption, um, can I just take a stack of images through focus and use that to figure out the three dimensional absorption profile? 
And yes, absolutely, this is deconvolution microscopy. So deconvolution bright field microscopy can do this. Yeah, these are great questions, by the way. I'm not making fun of yeah. them. Um, <laughs> um, I would like to know, Louise would like to know a little bit more about the last lecture. Could you go more into the details and explain a bit about the, the physics based learning? How do you put the physics into the network structure? Particularly, could, could you go more into the logic behind the unrolling algorithm? Sure, and this is so what like, is the physics behind it? Um, I'm going to pull up the slides that I have on this. Yeah, I don't have much in these slides, unfortunately. Uh, so this is not my expertise, I will say. Um, a couple of my students primarily came up with this, or like, you know, it's been around um, this unroll stuff. So they came up with the idea to use it for our image reconstruction. So I'm not the expert in this, but I'll explain it to you how I understand it. So if you take your optimization algorithm, then you can think of it, it, there are always these iterative optimization algorithms. So essentially the unrolled neural network is just the optimization algorithm uh, unrolled in the sense that one, this is a layer of the network. So it would contain like all of the things you're trying to solve for. Um, and then all of the parameters of this optimization, like maybe like the, the sparsity constraint, uh, hyperparameters, et cetera. And you uh, you put basically each um, iteration of the algorithm becomes a layer of the network. And then we know how that layer talks to the next layer because we know how that optimization algorithm like gradient descent or ADMM or whatever you're using, we know how it does the updates to get to the next layer where you have um, like your, your next estimate. So this is one, after one iteration, we have this estimate of the image. After K iterations, we have a new estimate of the image. And the, the mapping between the layers of the network describes how you, you go from one update to the next update step through this iterative optimization process. So if we just start with that, this would just be the iterative optimization algorithm. And all we did was pretend it was a neural network. And then people will think it's cooler because you're doing machine learning now. You're not just doing boring old math optimization. But uh, in, rea in reality, like what we do with this is that we then start learning different parameters, like we might learn the um, the hyperparameters of the optimization. And we always learn them based on some like loss function or cost function. Usually it's like the error. So we're going to train this thing with input output known pairs. So we might look like we might know what the image was and we do this attempted reconstruction and then have some function that describes how wrong our current estimate is. Uh, so yeah, that's like sort of the the level that I can understand. But so when you're asking about how the physics comes in, basically the physics was in the original physics-based algorithm by virtue of this A matrix, right? So when we had this optimization problem, which is what we're solving with the iterative optimizer that's that was used to form the network, um, this A matrix included all of our information about the physical system and how it works. And since every iteration of this algorithm is a layer of the network, then every layer of the network contains that, uh, it contains information about the physics by by that A matrix. And how you do the update depends on the A matrix because that's how you did, you took a, a, a gradient step to get to the next, maybe a gradient step or whatever step you took to do the next update. Uh, it incorporated, information about that A matrix, which is the known physics. And so I like to think of it that in that sense that the the physics of the problem is baked into this A matrix. And so it's baked into the architecture of the network because it sets how the different layers are made and connected to each other. And so that makes the, the network efficient because we're not just like throwing it into a UNet or a ResNet or something, you know, some of these like pre-baked uh, basic uh, neural network architectures and just hoping that's a good architecture. We're, we're basically making the architecture in a way that takes into account the physics and that was our whole goal. Okay, great. Uh, so Martina wants to know, uh, would the principle of the coded uh, illumination microscope also be possible for fluorescent imaging if you would have a laser in a programmable digital mirror device? 
Yeah, so we try to do this. And I'll, um, I'll say that, um, let me see if I can find some slides on it. They're in my, so we try to do this and you can't exactly do it. We want to do it with the LED array. And so if you change the illumination angle for a fluorescent sample, so you come in at different illumination angles and you hit a non-fluorescent sample, then the light scatters. And as you come in from different angles, the angle of the scattering changes. That's the whole principle of this shifting in Fourier space that makes this all possible. So that doesn't happen with fluorescence, right? You come in from whatever illumination angle and the fluorophore lights up and it, it just emits in all directions or in the particular directions. It doesn't care what direction the illumination came in at. So you can't just do this. So we wanted to try to do it anyways. And so our idea was basically that we were gonna put a diffuser or something on top of the sample such that when I come, so when I come in from, uh, turn on one LED, it goes through, the, the light goes through the diffuser and it makes a speckle pattern on the sample. When I turn on a different LED now, as I change the illumination angle of the LEDs, after going through that um, diffuser, then the pattern on the sample, which is a speckle pattern, should simply shift. So we did this with scotch tape um, and you can illuminate from different angles and the pattern does indeed shift. I think these are videos you can watch. So this is sticking the scotch tape into the system. And then we start changing our illumination. And, oh, this is changing to focus, sorry. We're not seeing so finding... your screen, Laura, oh, just in case you think sorry. we are. Yeah, thanks for telling me. Uh, I'm still not very good with Teams. This is the first time I've used it. Okay, so this is the system. We just stick some scotch tape in front of the sensor, and not in front of the sensor, it's from the sample. And then we can illuminate the sample with these speckle patterns that do indeed shift with the illumination angle, which was the whole goal. Um, and we tried to do the same thing where we get this super resolution in the sense that we have a low NA detection object objective lens for the detection, and we illuminate with really high frequency speckles. Um, so a much larger NA on the illumination side by virtue of the speckle features being much smaller than the diffraction limit of the microscope. Um, so uh, here's the system. We try to do this in the LED array uh, microscope. It didn't work because the LEDs were too, like by the time the LEDs go through um, a diffuser, they didn't create very sharp speckles and what was left was not high enough contrast or bright enough intensity to work for like typical fluorescent samples, which just require more illumination than phase imaging does. So we built a separate system with the laser illumination that was much brighter and we put this tape in as our as our diffuser. Um, there were all kinds of problems with this. That speckle pattern wasn't just a shift like we wanted it to be. We had to calibrate that. We had to put an extra system here to measure the, the low resolution coherent image in order just to correct the, uh, figure out how the speckle was changing. But we did manage to get a result from this eventually. Um, so we get this fluorescent super resolution. This is the speckles, the illumination speckles. Um, the coherent data here is that this extra system we put on in order to to measure the speckles themselves. Um, but here's the the super resolved. So big field of view because we used a low NA objective, but we can zoom in and we have high resolution across that big field of view. Um, yeah, and so since we were using since we were using this coherent system to correct for the speckle stuff, we realized we can get phase information for free. So we also get quantitative phase um, super resolved images as a result. These are just beads and they have both amplitude and phase. Uh, they're fluorescent beads that are also phase objects. Um, yeah, and here's just an example. Oh, I can't. Yeah, so here you can just see the, the improvement, the, the resolution improvement um, that we got from the system. I forgot the amount, I think it was 4X. Um, but the system also had all kinds of problems. Um, we had to take a lot of images in order to get this to work. So it wasn't very fast. Um, and yeah, and it was a whole separate system that was pretty bulky. I, originally, I wanted it to work on the LED array, and I just don't think that's feasible. Right, that, that sounds like one of those projects that, that we often get at these summer schools where a student has planned to do something, but uh, then meets a professor mm -hmm. like yourself and they say, well, 
maybe you don't want to go down that road and and you save <laughs> them six or 12 months of heartache. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, ben Moon wants to know what is the data processing latency for the gigapixel imaging that you've done? Is there hope that this could be near real time in the future? Yeah, so this is like not our specialty and we were just trying to get everything to work. And then once it worked, we're like going off to all these other new ideas. And I don't have any PhD students that I could convince to spend on, spend time on like making the reconstructions more efficient. So with the like with the Gauss-Newton approach, it takes about six seconds for each patch. A patch is a 200 by 200 pixel um, part of the, the lateral images. So if you want to reconstruct a whole gigapixel, you need, I don't know how many patches, but lots of patches. Um, the good news is it's all just Fourier transforms and it's just these iterative algorithms with Fourier transforms. And so uh, it's also done on a patch by patch basis. So it's very, very parallelizable. We just didn't do that. Um, so we do it on GPU. So we do whatever we can fit into the GPU. Um, and so then it can you know, you can do, I think we can, oh, I don't really want to give numbers also because um, these are these iterative algorithms with diminishing returns when you do more iterations. So I might tell you that it takes, you know, like 30 seconds or so to reconstruct a gigapixel, but then the images I show you might have taken a lot longer because we just ran it to lots of iterations just to make sure we get the highest quality image. So you're very much trading off quality versus uh, versus compute time. And we went for quality every time because we didn't care about processing offline. If you wanted to do it real time, I think you could. You would just need to pay money and put some time into the parallel processing. Um, so I, I don't say that we do that, but I think you could. The next question we have, uh, Laura, is from Atta. Uh, they ask, in the hardware setup of spectral coded illumination, LEDs are used to illuminate the sample. Does the color of these LEDs matter? Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the phase of a sample is related to wavelength just by 2 pi by lambda. So it matters, but it doesn't matter much in the sense that it's just a scaling factor, right? So uh, it depends on your, your sensor too. If you have a color sensor, um, you can get color images. So if you have a color sensor, you're going to want to use colored LEDs. You can do like the RGB separately or all at once. Um, there's some leakage between the different channels. But if you're trying to do phase imaging, um, most biological samples are not dispersive materials, meaning that the phase at red versus blue is the same. It's just scaled directly by this 2 pi by lambda. So if you take away the 2 pi by lambda and you just look at optical path length, it should be the same for all wavelengths in the visible spectrum for most biological samples, unless they have some, some material dispersion, which it, they would make them a weird sample. There are a few that, that do that. Um, so we usually use green just because it's cheap and easy to get good uh, LEDs in that wavelength and the sensors are pretty sensitive to it. Perfect. Um, the next question we have then is from MK. Uh, they ask, in lecture four, you had discussed on approximating the multi-layered tissue as a single scattering born medium. By modifying the forward model to multi-layered born, we can achieve multi-slices. Can you tell me more on what is the depth resolution achievable and what is the slab thickness that you are talking about? Oh yeah, so that's actually pretty easy. The slab thickness should, so you set the slab thickness in computation, but you should set it to be at least as small as the depth of focus or depth of field of the system. Um, so that's just like depth of field just goes as lambda over Na squared. So you just calculate that and you want your slab thickness to be smaller than that, but if it's so, if it's a lot smaller, then you're just wastefully oversampling. So this is like exactly like talking about Nyquist sampling. Um, if you think of your like depth of field is like your Nyquist sampling essentially. So we usually do it a little bit smaller than that just to not have uh, sampling issues. Cool. Uh, the next question we have then is from. 
Giles, uh, they ask, are we at the point with computational microscopy where it is being used in consumer products? For example, could a smartphone reprocess pictures taken with the cameras as if they were taken with a different lens, focus, aperture, etc.? cetera? Uh, yeah, so if you're talking about computational photography, the answer is yes. And I remember maybe 10 years ago at the main computational imaging conference, which is a lot of computational photography folks. Our group is one of the few that started with microscopy. Now there's like much more in the computational photography for computational imaging space that do microscopy. But I remember that there was a talk by one of the leaders in the field who was complaining that we do all these cool stuff that don't go anywhere and they're never consumer products. And now 10 years later, it's really come to fruition almost every cell phone camera is using a huge amount of computational imaging. The Google Pixel phone is super cool. It has essentially like a two pixel light fields, light field uh, camera behind it that's that's running. Uh, so basically all of these cameras that are doing all this depth sensing, um, uh, changing the aperture. So my iPhone, I put it in portrait mode and it blurs out the background in the same way I could get with a large aperture digital SLR lens. That's all computational and it's all based on knowing depth information. Um, so the iPhone has a couple of cameras. This is all doing all kinds of computational imaging um, and all, a lot of the other cameras do um, a lot for depth information. But then uh, you also look at the Google camera has a, a really cool um, night imaging photography and that's using burst mode. So they they don't just take one picture, they take a whole bunch of pictures really quickly and then they can computationally put them together. In, in the night case, it's to get rid of the noise that you would get with uh, night photography and they can do awesome things with very few photons coming into each image and correcting all of the motion blur. There was also a really cool example of super resolution in the Google phone from the Google group. Um, Apple, I don't know, they're just secretive, but they're doing all kinds of this stuff as well. Um, and then, uh, so that's photography. Absolutely, this is useful, and this is a big part of the reason why people don't buy cameras anymore because their phone camera is good enough. It's not because the optics got better on the phone camera. It's because the cameras got better um, when they started using like computational approaches. Microscopy also has lots of computational imaging and uh, it had it long before anybody started talking about computational microscopy. Like all of these quantitative phase measurements are computational in some sense. I would highlight super super resolution techniques as they're all computational in microscopy methods. So palm, storm, all these localization techniques, I would consider computational microscopy. Um, structured illumination is another one you can buy consumer products for. And then there's also a lot of work behind the scenes that they might not be telling you about where they're doing, you know, deconvolution to clean up your microscopy images, et cetera. So that that I would also sort of put in that bucket. So oh, so the, the question was about like taking with different lens focus aperture and certainly if your camera does that on your phone now, uh, you can take with different, make it look like it was taken with different lens focus aperture. I don't see the need for that in microscopy so much. Maybe focus, uh, we can do autofocusing, etc. Cool. I think uh, Surya has a question or two as well. Yeah, um, hi. So uh, Lupe has a question uh, about multi-layer multi bone scattering model. How small should be the layer thickness in a way to get enough info about backward scattering? This is kind of similar to the question before the one which you answered now. Um, so mm -hmm. if you have anything to add. Oh, for backward scattering. Uh, I don't actually know. I would assume it's the same. Um, so a couple of my students have been looking into the backward scattering aspect of this. We actually built a setup with two objectives. We were trying to collect the forward and backward scattering in the principle that it should help with um, reconstructing multiple scattering effects that the backward scattering should be very useful information to solve that inverse problem and we could never get we could do we just did some simple validation experiments we could never get our models to match the actual data we just still don't really know why it's really really dim light that's coming backward from biological tissue um, so i would assume that the layer thickness would be the same would have the same considerations 
uh, for backward scattering, but I really don't know too much about it. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is based on lecture four, uh, the timestamp 2144. Uh, how many raw images are needed to fill the synthetic aperture and what is the typical exposure times for the acquisition of all these raw images? Is lateral drifting drifting during image acquisition ever an issue? And if so, how is it mitigated? Thanks. Yeah, great question. So how many images are needed to fill the synthetic aperture? That completely depends on like how much super resolution you're doing. So if you um, if you want to double your NA, then you need, well, it's a circle, right? So um, if you want to double your NA, you need to figure out how many times that circle needs to fit within a circle twice the, the radius. Um, so, and you can flexibly trade things, these things off. So if you have a time budget, then you might say, I can only take 10 images before my sample is like moving appreciably and this is not going to work anymore. Um, so those 10 images, should I use them to get higher resolution in one dimension or should I use an objective with higher resolution and sacrifice my field of view? Um, so it totally depends on the situation, but you can look at like basically look at those Fourier transform plots. How big is your circle relative to the one you want to get? And then you need to have uh, sufficient overlap, like 50% overlap between all of the subsequent images. So this is where when we did this multiplexing where we designed the coded patterns, we got rid of all of the extra data that's caused by these overlaps, um, such that basically if I have a one megapixel camera and I want a 10 megapixel image, I should need to take 10 images to, to reconstruct that. Um, maybe 11 if you want to make sure that it's very robust. Uh, and then what is the typical exposure times? Uh, that's a good question. I don't actually know. You'd have to look for the papers, but usually we're running the camera at its full frame rate, 100 frames per second. So um, I think they always run it. I think they design the pattern so that the camera is always running at 100 frames per second. Um, and then the patterns would have more or less LEDs on to make sure that it was appropriately exposed. Uh, OK, and then is there lateral drift during acquisition? Yes, so the motion of the sample during the acquisition will cause big problems if it's moving appreciably over the number of images you take. So you need to think about that when you're designing, like you can't take 100 images if it's not, like a CLE and swarm that's running across the screen. We've actually been working on what we call space time methods to try to, to, try to like uh, estimate the motion of the sample while we're doing the reconstruction so that we can correct for motion. We did this in the DPC or like four images phase imaging case and we're, we've well yeah we're trying to do it for the the Fourier tachography case where you take a lot of images um yes yeah, so that's like hopefully something we could we can use to correct it there's been some really nice progress in in these methods for motion deep blurring but I don't have results for that yet perfect uh, so the next question question is by Sergey uh, what is the best achievable resolution of your coded detection and coded illumination microscopes? What are the principal limitations? Um, so for the coded detection, um, the best achievable resolution is the diffraction limit of whatever aperture you're using. So you can just treat, like for the lensless cameras, you treat the size of the sensor as your aperture size. And then you have to look at, at like what, what range of angles are you collecting from the sample? And that's like your like numerical aperture and your best case resolution will be the um, will be the diffraction limit resolution that goes with that numerical aperture. We actually do a little bit better than that, and that's only because we use these nonlinear regularizers, but it's totally unfair to say that we're actually doing better than that. That's really just this idea that it's a rule of thumb and that uh, you can computationally detect two things uh, even when they're a little bit closer than that. So it's not really fair to say we actually do better than that. Um, yeah, so limitations are diffraction limit in that case. For the coded illumination, the uh, the best achievable resolution is the diffraction limited resolution given by the numerical aperture. That's the sum of the objective and the illumination aperture, uh, numerical apertures. So if I use a like a, a one and a objective lens and my illumination goes the full 180 degrees, then I can get an NA of two as my maximum. 
In practice, we don't really do that because you probably, this sort of like technique tends to be more useful for things where you have a, a low NA objective lens because that gives you the big field of view and then you and then you use the illumination to bring it to a higher higher NA reconstruction. Okay, so the next question is by Michael. Uh, he's asking what kind of image quality metrics do you use when you estimate error or decide whether the reconstruction is correct or better than the other one? Yeah, we usually just use mean squared error, but we've looked at a lot of the like so in in a lot of the photography or graphics, they have all these like really neat um, error metrics like uh, like S sim or uh, where it's like a structural similarity. It's basically like a metric that was invented to match your eye. So very often you've probably seen this. You look at the error of some, you look at two images and you say this one's better than that one, but it actually has more error um, by some L2 metric just because your eye picks up on different things. So there are these metrics you can use for like um, perceptual image quality that we've played with. But usually we just use like a L2 or something like that. Okay, uh, so the next question is the lensless approach could be an advantage technique for multipotent microscopy since each lens represent losses of the signal. Have you seen any application of the lensless camera for multiphoton applications? Uh, so if you mean for multiphoton illumination I think it would be bad because it's you're splitting up the light too much in multi-photon you need you would need a lot more light to get it to, to actually get a good signal if you're talking about for imaging multi-photon um I'm not sure what uh what David means by each lens represents losses in the signal um yeah I guess I'm not totally sure I've never seen it um no I haven't seen it and it might be just that uh, we don't do well with, so the lensless cameras don't do super well with very low signal to noise ratio, which might be the case for a lot of multi-photon systems. Okay, we could move to the question from, move on to the question from Evelyn. So one of the problems in prostate cancer is being able to accurately determine the tumor, but because it is a soft tissue and when using radioactive methods, it's difficult to distinguish the different types of tissues in the prostate. Do you think it is a good option to use microendoscopy to obtain a 3D image of the prostate? And when applying the quantitative phase technique, could we distinguish these different soft tissues within the prostate? Or maybe uh, can there be some disadvantage that may complicate its application? Yeah, I know nothing about this application, so I don't want to speculate too much, but I suspect that, uh, yes, phase would probably help you distinguish soft tissues, but it would probably not be useful because you're trying to look like deeper within tissue, which there's a lot of scattering and that will be really hard to do. Like uh, these phase methods don't work well, as we talked about with OCT um, in at any like reasonable depth in tissue. Okay, um, last not but the least, David has a very important question. Does the green dog in your photos have a name? I don't know. I don't think so. It's the Thorlabs dog. I think it's just called the Thorlabs dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, Maybe we uh, should throw yeah, that out there. Say, thanks for the motivating and informative <laughs> session. Thanks. This hey, was fun. Thanks, thanks to all the team. Uh, we're almost on time and uh, that was quite a marathon session. So I think we can say <laughs> you passed your exam, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, well done. Uh, that, was, uh, that was extraordinary and uh, wonderful, detailed and caring and kind answers. So thank you so much uh, for that and all the effort you put into the video lectures. Uh, normally at this point in a summer school, we'd be able to give you a nice applause or a mm -hmm. bula boss, as we would say in Ireland, in Irish, uh, but that's not possible. But mm -hmm. uh, people can leave their appreciation in the comments uh, uh, and the, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, certainly, I know I learned a lot and appreciated uh, what what you've uh, provided for us. So thank you so much. Was, uh, I hope you found it rewarding. Uh, it certainly we did. <laughs> Thanks thank to everybody for their patience for staying online. I know in uh, it, it can't be daytime or even a reasonable evening time in every part of the world, but uh, your dedication <laughs> Uh, is amazing. So it's amazing to see all the countries and we will see you again tomorrow.
Thanks, everybody. That's right. super. Bye bye, Laura. All right. All right. Your day is just beginning. Our